Sisters, who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder. And I'm here with Tom Campbell, uh, one of Twisted Mind Time RuPaul's Drag Race. Hello, Fenton. Hello, literary darling. Editor of the Wow Report, James St. James. Hello, darling. And our very extra super duper special guest, Ryan Sahant. Hello. Ryan. The handsomest man on Ryan. television. Oh my God. Look at that face. Look at that face. <laughs> oh my God. He's joining <laughs> us uh, here in Hollywood from New York mm -hmm. via yeah. um, what they call FaceTime. Ah. Some very, very complicated technology. Yes. 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 There we go. We can see him now. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think. It yes. actually works. So far, so good. And um, Ryan, you need no introduction. Of course, you are, you know, one of the stars. I have a special place in my heart for you, but I'm supposed to love everybody equally <gasps> from the Million Dollar Listings franchise, Scandalo. and I do, but, <laughs> but I have a little special, special little flutter for you. And of course, most recently, your own spin-off show, yes. Sell It Like a Hand, which is yes. fantastic. Uh, you know, it's just a... And who knew you were such a goofball? I did. <laughs> 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 and of course, on Tumblr, we can still find that uh, season two, was it, with the, the shower scene? When, when was it? Yeah, season two was the infamous shower yeah. scene with me. Yeah, yeah. And, and all you have to do is just type in Ryan Serhant <laughs> shower, and it, it will come up. So. Oh, good. Oh, great. <laughs> good to know. How, because you're in incredible shape, Ryan. And that's a, that's a to be spoken it's about. well on this. this. How, how <laughs> often, how, what, what, do you, what amount of time do you dedicate to physical fitness each day or each week? Uh, between an hour and hour and a half a day. Oh, wow. Oh. That's why we look so different. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Do you do it at the same time? Yeah, Monday through Friday uh, at 5.30. You're up early, um, yeah. In the morning. In the morning. Which That's is how like people are successful. They get up at 5 in the morning. Do you have a trainer or do do it on your own? Uh, no, I work out with a, a group of guys and a trainer every morning. And then on the weekends, I'll do my own thing or I'll go for a run or I'll lift on my own I'll figure it out but it's important it's it's so a part of my routine that my days feel weird if I don't work out in the morning so Ron I know you're an avid uh, listener to this show <laughs> I know you've never missed a single episode uh, we count down the top 10 things each week that make us go wow, wow. and obviously wow <laughs> But we got to start with number 10 now, right? Yes. Okay. So, and feel, d Ryan, just chime in whenever. Or hang up, whichever feels right. <laughs> no, you stay, just with whatever us. Feels stay with us. Best for your brand. Um, <laughs> number 10. At number 10. Now, uh, you know, I think the whole world is revving up uh, over the next few months to get ready to see Lady Gaga in A Star is Born. Oh, we can't wait. And I'm one of those people, too. So, it was recently announced that Barbara Streisand put A Star is Born. Her version, the unedited version from the 70s with Chris Stoppard. Oh, it's sort of a reworked version. She's putting it back on Netflix. It's right? on Netflix. It is on Netflix. So I went to watch it, but you know, I'm lazy, and that's like th two and a half hours or something. But I also realized that Barbara has recently given Netflix or placed on Netflix her classic 60s musical television specials. Right, okay. Which... I call me Barb. Call me Barbara. Call me. Yes, my name is Barbara, and I, 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 I was, my name is Barbara is the first one from '64. I've seen it before. It's in black and white. It is the moment that she is a superstar in Funny Girl. So it's like if you want to know what Barbara Streisand was like before, you know, like at that peak moment in her early, early twenties. Watch that. There's an amazing uh, scene that happens at at uh, uh, what's the store Bergdorf. Oh, I remember that. Goodman, yes, uh -huh. where she's dancing around there. That first special, and then I just watched. Color Me Barbara, yes, yeah, which yeah. is the second special, which had happened in 66. And the first one's in black and white, and they did it in color. And gotta love Barbara, because it's clearly the, it's clearly the special is like the 86 VHS release of it, because it starts off with Barbara in that white turtleneck, you know, when she did the... She did <laughs> I the, love um, your Barbara <laughs> I love my Barbara impersonation, too. <laughs> um, and it's her in that white sweater turtleneck that she wore in her backyard. So the cowl, yes. yes, the 80s cowl she's neck. she's talking yeah. about, you know, 20 years ago, I did she's this special. She's got the nails. Yeah, she's yes. got the nails. And as much as she's a perfectionist, at one point in the in the description, she's like, hey, 
Like, she's <laughs> coughing in the middle of her thing, but whatever. They had one take, I guess. Videotape is very expensive. So, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, and I want to pick on Barbara because I uh, sort of became aware of her in the mid-70s just because of my age, and she was a little bit, you know, it was the main event. I loved the main <laughs> event. That's my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> Ryan, do you have a, a favorite you- Barbara Streisand movie by any chance? <laughs> you can say no. Wasn't she in, like, a Meet the Parents sequel or something yes, like that? Yes, Meet the Fonkers. Yes, she was Meet the yeah. yes. That's okay. the one I've seen. All right. <laughs> all right. That's a good straight answer. Um, the This is, so the first, it's all about Barbara by herself, and it's in three parts, Call Me Barbara. And um, the first part takes place at the Philadelphia Art Museum. And it's just her, and they they shot it in w- one night, and she's like singing like as a Cleopatra. She looks into paintings and becomes the paintings. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I love it. Yes, yes. as and, one does. Yes. And then the second part, which I think I realized why she didn't do new wraparounds, because the second part they do back in New York, and it's it's with the circus animals. It's like cats and aardvarks and penguins. And she goes, you know, we, have, we didn't, who knew that if we had hot lights that the penguins would get sick? And I'm thinking, like, you can't do that today. <laughs> you know, just, but it's kind of fabulous. And it, now it's, it's, it's sticky, Barbara. The first one's just her singing and running around in the museum, you know. And then the second one, she's doing all her Barbara shtick, which is like, you know, you know, this is how I talk. What do you, what do you want? I can speak French, too. And then she <laughs> looks at an aardvark and sings uh, something about, like, um, <laughs> that face. Now, words that she's looking at her face. Uh, she a, she was, he must be Jewish. What is the face of an oddvark? It's got a long nose, or, or maybe it's an anteater. I'm, I'm very, I'm very or knowledgeable about animals. And the third part is just her in concert. And she's now the whole, it, it's early color, so the, the special is orange and pink, and you know, they do all that crazy, like you're watching a color special. But the last part is her on sort of these stairs that go into infinity, and she's wearing a sleeveless gown with, an, with a What's it, Ampere yeah. uh, thing? Barbara is fully Barbara in 1966. Like, there's no real variation. And it's spectacular. It's she, like, it's a spectacular. She must have been paid a ton of money to do that. Do you I think? think she enjoyed, I think that was back when Barbara enjoyed being Barbara, and she enjoyed performing, and right. she enjoyed having, I don't think she's that Barbara anymore. Yes. I don't think she enjoys. <gasps> You're saying she's grumpy? <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> what do you know about grumpy? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then right. there was this, and I always like to pick on Barbara, but she's kind of a phenomenon. And I couldn't help but think that lady, like so many of the artists have modeled themselves, the divas after Barbara. Diana Ross kind of wanted to be Barbara Streisand. Beyonce has sort of claimed that she's new Barbara Streisand. Mm-hmm. But Lady Gaga... Mm-hmm. Really is because late only only Lady Gaga would run around a museum singing by herself. You know what I'm saying? Number nine. Well, this next one at number nine, Ryan, I think will fascinate you. Fascinate <sighs> you. <laughs> we want to please so badly, Ryan. <laughs> I no, I have to stop laughing and I have to get a, a little uh, into character because I'm a little upset because uh, Coco the gorilla died this week. I don't know if you guys have all been paying attention to the news. Coco, the the the, gor- the talking gorilla. Um, did you guys know about Coco? He was I, famous. Coco was very, could uh, sign talk. language. Coco was a, a Western yeah. lowland gorilla who was born in captivity in San Diego in 1971. And very early on, her captor, her 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 handlers noticed that she had an aptitude for learning, and that she was they were able to teach her sign language. And she learned up to two thousand words. No, not two thousand. No, she did. She knows yeah. two thousand words. Wow. She's able to use one thousand of them. Basically, it's just noun verbs. There's not a lot of adverbs and conjunctions well, and stuff. Just like, like my Spanish. It, it, she, 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 but, she, <laughs> she speaks. She's able to say like Coco sad, Coco hungry. Those types. She of would the, speak. No, 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 she signs. She oh. signs. She says she'll sign Coco sad. Coco, Coco wants to play with Kitty. She loved kittens. She was super affectionate. She hugged little kittens. Yeah, she, she had, she had a, very famously, she had a kitten, and she wrote a book about it called Coco's Kittens. With, Co- uh, with 1,000 words. Yeah. She wrote and and um, it was a bestseller. It was really, it was huge uh-huh. in the 80s. Uh, she also was a painter. Gorilla wrote a book? Yeah, she, the gorilla wrote the book. Um, and then she also was a painter of some renown, and she had a lot of uh, art openings. She <laughs> Was for a while there. She was a movie critic. I don't know if you remember this in the '90s, and she loved Mary Poppins. She lo- she didn't like men. She wasn't a big fan of men, but she liked Santa Claus. In any Santa Claus movie, she would just she would say Coco loves Santa. That would be her review. Wow. Or, you know. Um, uh, at another point, did Coco ever sell real estate? 
She didn't. <laughs> but but there's a couple, there, there are two vo- very, very funny stories that I just want to tell very quickly. One time she ripped the sink off the wall in her in her cage. <laughs> That's and, Barbara. <laughs> and when the, when her handlers came in and said, "Coco, what is this?" She signed. Not Coco, Kitten did it. She she tried to blame the kitten for ripping the sink off the wall, oh, which meant that she had an aptitude for lying, and she under you know she was she was maybe so a joke human. or something. Also, she <laughs> um, loved um, Robin. Will- oh no, she loved Mister Rogers. She would watch Mister Rogers every day, oh. and she he, went on Mister Rogers. She right? did, and then he came to visit her, and the first thing she did was take off his shoes. Because that's what he does every day when he on the show, and so when she met him, she took she grabbed him and she made his she took she grabbed his shoes. Isn't that really I'm sweet? Gonna, actually, it's kind of heartbreaking. Ryan and E. Bonmo for Coco. Oh wow! I'm very, very, I'm very sad for. I, I kind of want my own Coco. It sounds super helpful to have around the house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the thing about chimps or gorillas. What was Coco, by the way? Coco was a, a, a gorilla, a Western yeah. lowland gorilla. It's, I think they're very cute when they're young, and then as they get older, they develop some personality well, problems, like ripping the sink off. The wall and well, I know with chimpanzees they say that you can have them for six or seven years and then they go through puberty and that's when like they become nasty face ripping, ripping. off. Yeah, mm. no, that's not good. Yeah, you don't want that. But come on, for Co- Coco's defense, she ripped one sink off the wall her entire <laughs> life, and it was probably kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, Damn Coco God. never had that, but I think I know like um, Bubbles, Michael Jackson's. You know, they were, he got a little aggressive at age nine or something like that. I think when, that might be different though. Yeah, they have <laughs> because he'd been being molested. Oh, stop! <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> All right, number eight. Well, number eight, uh, th- th- Ryan. I've been waiting to do this with you because, like, I've been so excited about you coming on the show. And because uh, I said we should do a special all about erections, like about oh. structures, buildings. Oh, good. Favorite buildings. <laughs> and I just uh, spent last week in on Paris. And you've been to Paris too, right? Yes. Yeah, we filmed our season finale and then our listing uh, yes. last year in Paris. So here's my question to you. What is your favorite building in Paris? Uh, I mean, obviously, it's the Eiffel Tower. Good answer. Good answer. Mm, wrong answer. What? <laughs> well, my favorite, there's no wrong answer, of course. My favorite building in Paris is the Pompidou Center. Okay. Which is modern y. It's, it's modern. It's like a giant. It's like a Barbara Streisand special, but in Paris, and it's a building. <laughs> <laughs> no. It opened in 1977. Gotta move. And it's the largest contemporary art museum in all of Europe. And it looks like an oil refinery. And the, the whole concept of it was it was very groundbreaking. And it's the sort of high temple of oh, high yes, tech. Yes, yes, yes. And so all the infrastructure, you know, the pipes, the conduits, the elevators, the it's all exposed, cooling systems, right? the esca- it's all on the outside. So the building has this exoskeleton. Well, I remember that I, I've been that going up the, the elevator yeah. always along the side, and yeah. it looks like a giant tube. Much like God. the Beverly Center here in Los Angeles. Well, they, I think, they, I think okay. they must have ripped it off. Is <laughs> <I'm> sure. <laughs> it's the most amazing building. And it's a, it, there's a lot of, it's an art museum, right? It's, it's the yeah. largest contemporary mm-hmm. art museum in all of Europe, and it's sort of just plonked down in the middle of Paris. It's funny because a lot of modern architecture looks kind of shitty after a few years. It's like you know, well, especially in places like Paris, where like when they like at the Louvre when they put that giant, you know, the iron triangle, pay, the triangle yeah. pyramid there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It, it looks it looks out of place. It looks, you know, I'm so I. But you like this? I'm afraid I do. Right? I, well, you know, I like Soviet bus stops, so <laughs> that's my favorite. Uh-huh. That's, your that's my uh-huh. jam. Uh-huh. Ryan, it's got you... this kind of construction chic to it because it always looks like it's under construction. Yes. Which, which, you know, Paris actually is pretty famous for the way that they mask all of their construction. A lot of their buildings, they use screens uh, and not just normal scaffolding that look like the building yes. that's there so that it oh. doesn't look like the city's under construction. And yet you have this big you know, art center that looks like it's permanently under construction yeah. in New York. That building that you love in Paris is almost every building. It's <laughs> <laughs> true. All those. If you were to build a bit, I mean, have you a lust to build a building, Ryan? Uh, not really. I like selling them mostly. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the right line of work then. <laughs> All right, we have to take. We've got to take a quick break. Oh, here's the question. Okay, here's an architect question. Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. 
because uh, Ryan, what we do, as as you know, is before we take a break, we have a little trivia question to keep our one viewer tuned <laughs> over the break. <laughs> Don't go anywhere, one viewer. <laughs> anyway. So okay, so the Pompidou Center was designed by uh, Piano and Rogers, right? Renzo Piano, very famous Italian architect. He also designed two iconic buildings, one in London and one in New York. So I'm going to ask you what those buildings are. I mean, they're huge. I, I just like take a guess at the big building and you'll probably get it right. <laughs> so okay. you're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy. We'll be right back after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Oh, hi, my little fruits. I feel fruity. Yeah. 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 Oh! Fruit cake, banana split, strawberry lemonade, blueberry pancakes, and a chocolate covered pea. Hey, don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. And we're back. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm here with Tom Campbell, James St. James, Blake Edwards. Bla Blake, J Blake Edwards. <laughs> I say that sometimes too. It's your turn, Blake. You're like mm -hmm. incredibly golden. Hey, hey. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, our very super duper extra special guest, Ryan Sahant, who we just lost again. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, oh, fantastic. We can hear you. Live from New York City. Hey. Yes. So what, Ryan, have you any idea? Um, the question for the break was the architect who designed the Pompidou Center in Paris has also designed and built two iconic buildings, one in London and one in New York. Want to take a guess? Uh, Big Ben and the Woolworth Tower. Excellent guesses, <laughs> although they somewhat precede him. <laughs> I, I'm completely at a blank, Fenton. I, don't, I, I, I have nothing. Something to do with the Spice Girls in London. Well, you said something oh, that's to do good. We <laughs> said something to do with Star. The Olympic, the okay. Olympic Stadium well, in I'll London. I'll give you a clue for the one of them in New York. The one in New York is really new, but like brand new. I've been to uh, weeks. It's in the Meatpacking District. Oh. The Standard Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Diane von Furstenberg's And it's white and it's very boxy and it's big in the meatbag district. Is this the one that, that everyone moved into the Stark building? That it, uh, and it's a museum. Oh, oh the Whitney. Yes. Yes. Okay. There yes. we go. Uh, Whitney. Okay. <laughs> in New York, Whitney Museum. <laughs> like pulling deep. Right, and yeah. then, what's the London one? Uh, London one, okay. Our one viewer has just okay. left, by the way, but keep going. <laughs> it's the Shard. Have you seen the shard? No, I don't know. It's right, huge. Right, it's amazing. I'm it's American. Like, I don't oh, care about London. All right, all right, all right. Okay. <laughs> we are counting down the top 10 things that make us go, wow. wow. Number seven. And we have reached number seven, Tom. When award shows come along, I watch them, as I tell you, just to try desperately to cling on by my fingernails to pop culture and names. So the BT Awards were on, and I taped them, and I fast-forwarded through them, because that's the only way to see an award show as well. And I'm here to report on it. This past year in pop culture has been uh, an amazing breakthrough in many ways for black culture. And Cardi B, Tiffany Haddish, yes, yes. Uh -huh. and Black Panther. And the host uh -huh. was Jamie Foxx, but Jamie Foxx is kind of like hosted it like he was in his living room in his pajamas, like just, and he might have been wearing his pajamas at one point, but just really cool, really laid back. And again, it's it's there's something about the gathering of these events, and I know we live in a bubble, and we're all liberals, and no one cares, but there are these affirma affirmative moments of like where we're at and what's going on and celebrating what's good. And Jamie Foxx's whole thing was like, we're here not to like give awards, we're here to celebrate black excellence. And he just kept saying that, and I kind of... Loved it, and everyone's looking at everybody. No, we're looking at listening. Ryan, who keeps sort of appearing for moments. He's not into this. I, I, Ryan, Ryan is so <laughs> protecting Ryan, himself. Do you watch award it. shows? Uh, not really. <laughs> I'm going to be the most useless co-guest ever for this. <laughs> oh, it's good. But you, uh, you receive awards, right? 
uh, real estate awards, yeah. sales awards. I mean, Million Dollar Listing has been nominated for two Emmys, but we lost to the damn fish show twice. I think this year is going to be yo Wait, the, 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 the deep sea fisherman yeah, out there? Oh. Deadliest Catch. Yeah. Uh-huh. Deadliest okay. Catch, yes. And the other highlight, because I was talking about the BET Awards, <laughs> <laughs> um, was Deborah Lee, who's, who was the CEO of uh, BET and just stepped down, had been there for 32 years, also got like an icon award. And she talked about being a little black girl from Greensboro, North Carolina. And when she was growing up, all it was was like she loved seeing uh, uh, Motown and Ebony Magazine because they showed black people at their best. And she was so proud to be part of BET, which is a place where people can be unapologetically black. Here's my one and, and one more fun thing, and then a footnote, which is um, at one point, Nicki Minaj, who also performed, Jamie Foxx comes over and gives her champagne because she sold more records than any human being alive. But if you look really carefully, like eight rows back is Lizzo, who we love, wearing just this big bird yellow kind of outfit, and they're doing champagne, and Lizzo is just pounding down on her flask that she brought in. <laughs> you if you don't know to look for it, you won't see it. But go Lizzo, who didn't perform this year, but hopefully she will. Mm. Um, and, and Big Frida was that too, right? I think so. Yeah. And, and Big Frida and Lizzo just had a song, right? They do, well, they yeah. just performed at the Gay Pride. Oh, yes, right. Yeah. they did. They but the, the thing that struck me, and I'm not putting it down because, you know, progress, but the one... the one kind of tone or voice that wasn't there is that there isn't a big African-American gay presence, LGBTQ. Yeah. Now, yeah. I'm, I'm not putting it down, every progress moving forward, but uh, that was the one thing Pose that kind of struck me. Pose did not sweep the, right. the... RuPaul isn't at the BET Awards, but it was it was worth seeing. You can see it online, you can fast forward to the commercials, all that good stuff. I love it, I love it, I love it. Number six. Good luck making this segue, James. <laughs> what? what have you got for us at number six? Number six, uh, the, uh, news of the weird, uh, there was a story that just came out recently about a guy who was in a motorcycle accident and he had to have his foot amputated. And he went to the doctor afterwards and asked if he could keep the foot. And apparently there's no rule saying you can't keep the foot. And Does so, he live in Arizona or something where there are no rules? No, no, just, no. Okay. Um, I don't know okay. where you live. To. You're, you're asking too many questions too sorry, early sorry, on. Sorry. Okay, so the doctor gave him the foot in a bag and he decided, first of all, he thought he was going to make, he was going to bronze it and make a, a doorstop out of it. Sure. But then that was too cost prohibitive. And so he decided to gather his friends together and they made tacos out of his foot out of the meat in his foot oh, and they so no. all had a dinner party foot um, in mouth yeah apparently <laughs> I love it. there are no laws against cannibalism in the united states uh what? there's no there's laws against murder buying and selling of human oh. meat and corpse desecration yes. but no laws against eating the meat and so what he did was they, he, he says that um, they ate apple strudel, quiche puff pastries, fruit tarts, and chocolate cake. They drank gin lemonade punches and mimosas. And then the main course came out, fajita, ta- fajita tacos made from Chinese severed human limb. Um, uh, they, oh, there's the stump. God. You got a picture of the stump. Yeah, there's a, there's a picture of the, the leg. Oh. The oh. stump. <laughs> Um, you know, last week we were on with T.S. Madison yes, and we were, were doing these court cases and we did a, a cannibalism because there was that fantastic German on the end. Well, not fantastic German. I know I should stop, right? Do you guys <laughs> read the comments on the YouTube? I did not. I probably should. Cannibalism is not a popular subject with people. <laughs> it's not? No, it seems that some people find it repulsive, oh. sickening, churns their stomach. But go on. I just want to make sure that the other side is heard. Uh, Ryan, what do you think? Are you uh, pro-cannibalism, this, Ryan? This is, this, I'm just looking at these photos here, and it kind of looks like steak. Well, he says um, that, you know, uh, when they ask him what it tastes like, he says it tastes a little bit like, where was this? Let me see. Chicken. No, 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 no. It's not chicken. He says that it tastes like. I um, can't believe we're talking about this two weeks in a row. Yeah. This is oh, last show, uh, probably. It has a beefy flavor, um, and it was more akin to venison, is what he says. Mm. And that um, you think that it's going to taste like pork, but it's actually like a venison. You think it's going to taste like pork? <laughs> well, because I mean, I people the do say. Is it the, what do we think about this guy? It's that if we were stranded on a raft, knowing that people have eaten human flesh and meat before, would we eat each other? Oh, totally. Oh, I would eat all of you. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, when I'm stressed out, I'm hungry, so probably I would. Let's just talk a bit about the foot and the amount of bones of the foot. It doesn't seem like a meaty part of the body to me. Well, no. he says that he, uh, let me see. Does it serve four? Does it serve eight? Like... <laughs> 
Uh, it's, he says that he sautéed it over. He, he <laughs> marinated it. Suck you in. it. It is a very tough meat, and he said that he <laughs> marinated it overnight, and he, then they sautéed it with onions, pepper, salt, pepper, and lime juice. Oh. Um, but he, but there was had to be a lot of marinating to to soften it up a little bit. And I hate to go back to last week, but I do think we actually shocked T.S. Madison, don't you? <laughs> People on YouTube were saying it was like she had gone to the movie Get Out. <laughs> that she was trapped by two white men who were horrifying her, and she was looking for an escape. <laughs> I think that's pretty accurate. And actually. I'm in the T.S. seat this so, week. Right. Thank you. Number five. Well, maybe you should go on then to uh, number five. Oh, it's me, number five. I was in Paris last week. <laughs> and you know, like in Paris, you wander around the streets. I think that's like just a lovely thing to do in Paris. You know, you can go to the Eiffel Tower, but it's always so crowded. But you just sort of wander around. And I wandered into this little store, and this is for you, James. And it was a fan store, like a store that sells fans. And it's it was called. Oh, is this God, because I'm. A, is this because I'm a drag queen? Is this I, is, that, is this what this is? I just think you're a sort of very dangerous liaison type sort of person. <laughs> okay, a very Carl Lagerfeld. Yes, fruit free gowns and a hand snap of a, <laughs> of, a, of a hand of a what are they called? Collapsible fans. Yeah. Anyway, this this French company Duvelleroy is a fan maker, leather goods manufacturer. It was founded in 1827 by Jean-Pierre when he was 25. But the thing was, in 1827, hand fans were very out of fashion. You just had the French Revolution. And of course, uh, the king and Marie Antoinette, they were all into fans at the court, right. but they beheaded them all. And so suddenly it wasn't so cool to be with- Fans are out. They were out. But he revived the fan. And Queen Victoria became, uh, he became a big, a big fan fans. of the fans. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, here's the thing. The whole thing about fans and jean Pierre. Tell us, please, about the thing about fans. <laughs> is that jean Pierre had this brilliant idea to popularize fans by saying there's a secret language of fans. I should have oh, brought a yeah. fan uh -huh. along. Is it fanography? The, yes. Well, like twirling the fan in the left hand. Means I'm available for, for a pickup. No, nope. means we are watched. Oh. Carrying the fan in the right hand in front of her face means... Like I'm a the, bottom. <laughs> follow me. <laughs> Covering the left ear with the open fan means... Top. Do not betray our secret. Uh, this is one for you, James. Drawing the fan through the hand means... Scat. I hate you. Oh. James is confusing <laughs> fan language with the handkerchief codes of the 1950s and 60s in gay bars. Well, I was going to get there because... Uh, oh my goodness, we all think alike. <laughs> <laughs> we think alike and it's frightening. Go on. Jonathan Wolford, fashion historian, says that in fact this whole thing was made up. There was no such language of fans and it was merely a marketing device. Ryan, this is a marketing device. Like, is there a secret language of real estate agents where you like... I don't know, the way you turn the doorknob or you tweak the curtains. Do you have a, a secret language? We do, the, we do the pillow karate chop. See, That's what? right, for staging. Yes. Yes. Well, I think yes. um, when Coco had a fan and she'd break it in half, it meant I'm going for the sink next. <laughs> with the gorilla. Apparently opening the show, you know, like Madonna when she did that fabulous Vogue. 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 And she was, MTV you know, Music Awards opened it with a marvelous thrup. Yes. Opening and closing the fan means you are cruel, which I think is okay. opposite, okay. Right? right? Well, I also think of, you know, the fan dancing in the, the gay bars in the 1970s, yes. that that was a big, like, people would twirl around with fans, and it was like fanography. It was a big, it was, so it well, is flamenco something. flamenco dancing, too, right? Yes. Yeah. So fans through the years, through, through the millennia. And so, indeed, out of this supposed language of fans came the hanky code. Oh. oh. Okay. And how convenient. we got to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, Brian, are you up on your gay hanky code uh, languages, things? Do you know about this? No, I know nothing. So, back in, well, go ahead. No, yeah, you go ahead. Back in like the 50s or 60s, maybe before, when gay bars were uh, illegal, you, you people, you'd wear um, hankies of different colors, bandanas, in different pockets to uh, say what they're into sexually and if they were more uh, uh, top or bottom or things mm -hmm. of that nature. Like, oh, if you put it in your left pocket, it would meant you were bottom. If you were in the right pocket, it was you were top. And if you, it was like if you were into, uh, if you had a yellow one, that meant that meant you were into piss. If you were in a blue one, that meant 
you wanted to cuddle. If they, like the different things meant different things I sexually. I didn't know blue meant you wanted to cuddle. It I didn't. I I, I, <laughs> I used to always pee on you and you just wanted to cuddle. <laughs> dark blue, dark blue is butt sex, oh. and light blue is oral sex. Oh, oh okay. Yes. But here's my question for oh. you. So this is the question. Orange. Orange is our favorite color here at World of Wonder, but yeah. what does orange mean? If you're wearing an orange hanky in your back pocket, what are you saying? We'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonder's Wow Report. You ready, kitty girl? RuPaul's Drag Race is now in the world. Oh, welcome back to the Wow Report. We are counting down the top 10 things that made us go. Wow. wow. We have our super duper oh, heartthrob, really, matinee idol. <laughs> um, <laughs> Real jerk extraordinaire. Ryan Sahant. Million Dollar Listing New York. Currently airing on Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Loathing every second. Monday nights, my <laughs> listing New York. Gotta watch. He's so... gonna fire his agent after this. <laughs> <laughs> gonna fire us. Huh. So the question before the break was: We were just talking about the the secret lost language of fans, which begat the not so lost language of gay hanky codes. And we were talking about what certain colored hanky cheese in the back of your pocket means, right? Yeah. So the question was. Orange. If you're wearing an orange, and it's appropriate to ask because it is Pride Month, right? Right, sure. Yeah. So, what is the orange? If you run into someone wearing an orange hanky in their back pocket, I'm going to say it's toe sucking. I love it. I think they want to appear on the Wow Report if if they have an orange. Ryan, Uh, I want to say it's licking the inside of the elbow. Oh, yes. there you go. He, a man who knows how to please. <laughs> Blake. Blake, come on. Well, I know it's not scat because that's red. Okay. No, scat is brown and Thank red is so- blood. Oh, oh, okay, uh, okay you moving know on, too moving much. on. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know too much, James. <laughs> okay, here's this is surprising. Orange is anything goes. Oh. Yeah, absolutely up for anything. In olden days, days, that glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking. Anything goes. And do you know which side of which side is which? Which pocket is which? Left is bottom, right is top. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Dominant, not dominant. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Learn something new every day. Aren't you glad? Number four. So. This Number. segues kind of nicely into what I'm doing here, which is uh, this week in the New York Times over the weekend during Gay Pride. This is Gay Pride Month. Um, uh, a gay rights uh, pioneer trailblazer passed away at the age of 83. His name is Dick Leitch. Oh, right. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I saw this. I saw the uh, Did he do the, the obituary. gay flag? No, he did not. He, um, prior to... Uh, Stonewall, he was one of the most influential for uh, tearing down the entrapment laws that were around gay, gay bars. Did you know in 1966, when uh, being a homosexual was illegal in New York City in, our life, in my lifetime, um, that uh, you couldn't gather uh, and that bartenders couldn't legally serve you a drink if you were homosexual because they were a thing. And the New York Times even, because gays were considered disorderly for no reason, which is why, as we know, that a lot of the gay bars were run by the mafia because they would pay off the police and, you know, bars were constantly being raided. People couldn't, uh, gay people, while they were this sort of, the, not the safe haven, but they were the meeting place for gay people, uh, they had they were constantly being uh, raided. They were being put to jail. Uh, you could ruin your life, ruin your career, bring shame to your family. And so uh, these laws were being sort of uh, tested. Tested, and so Dick, along with a uh, New York Post reporter and a photographer, went 
to a bar where he said, I want, you know, I don't know, whiskey sour. And, and said, but having let you know, I'm a homosexual. So the bartender, and they have this great shot of him putting his hand over the glass and denying him. And that brought attention to this. And um, he was part, he was a president of the Mattachine, is yeah, that the how Mattachine you say? Society. The Mattachine yeah. Society, which is interesting because every movement kind of has its early leadership. And the Mattachine Society was, uh, because, gay, you know, I was thinking about over Gay Pride Weekend because Gay Pride sometimes gets, you know, everyone's so wild and crazy. Um, but the Mattachine Society would wear suits. And ties to and help normalize to normalize, it, yeah. uh-huh. which is always a first step, right? You think of like Motown and Martin Luther King in the in the civil rights movement. They were trying to normalize, you know, and sort of mainstream black. And then with with Martin Luther King, it was about uh, pacifists and 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 you know peaceful resistance, but. So in 66, he was doing this. He made a big thing. By 69, he was considered, when the Stonewall riots happened, he was considered old-fashioned. Like, you know. Like, they, they, they now they were into rioting and they were and into. And being you know, in your face. Yeah, uh-huh. And it was more trans and, you know, it was more inclusive. But it, And they looked at what he was doing as old-fashioned. People, it's, it's funny how movements move so quickly. Yeah. Because it used to be like, well, let's assimilate. Let's be part of the, the conversation. Well, then, and it, then, then it's act up and then it's. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes. And it was, uh, you know, and you think about it musically, it's like it was the Supremes and Gowns. Then it was James Brown and Aretha Franklin. You know, it was no longer like we're going to assimilate. We're the sound of young America. We are going to, we are black and proud and that's what uh, Stonewall did but you know you think about the bravery or just how how surreal it would be to live 50 less than well, is it 50 52 years ago in a city where being gay New York City the uh, Grange Village, it was legal to be gay, and that this guy had the power, and the and and, and I, that he was sti- that he was still around until just recently, yeah, and I don't think he ever got his. That. I don't think he ever got his due, though. I don't think he was. Uh, yeah, um, Michael Seligman, who works with us on different projects, uh, has been a, a magazine writer, and he interviewed him a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And, the, and one of the things that's kind of interesting, Dick said one of the reasons he got involved was because it was a really cute boy he wanted to spend time with. Oh. So that's why he got involved in the activism. So whatever gets you there is a good thing. But Dick Leish, gay pioneer, rest in perfection. Number three. We are transferring power oh now. James is abdicating his seat. For Blake, who's blonde and tan and fresh from vacation. <laughs> Hi, Blake. Hi. I wanted to talk a little about, bit about the re reboot of Roseanne, or which is now <gasps> tentatively titled The Connors. What are you pro or con? Pro. I don't think everyone should lose their job. So, brief history right. Roseanne made the racist tweet back in May. They canceled the show. And all these people that were signed on for the next season had lost their jobs. Talking about Lori Metcalf, John Goodman, and the crew. But now, isn't also the the problem with this that Roseanne has a financial interest in? She's the, oh, she is the creator of it. So any any time that they use characters that she created, she gets money. But it's come out that she's not financially gaining from this. It's, it, it's That's the part that's curious to me. You hit it, James, because um, the head of ABC programming, the woman said very much that they would only go forward with this if Roseanne didn't appear and didn't profit from the sequel. Now, that being said, they got her to walk away and give up her rights. Oh. I don't know that that was for free. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, is, is, isn't it her Did profiting? Did she get a $10 billion payday? <laughs> that's my question. And... It will be interesting because I, I guess for the sequel to who knows, and I, I confessed I watched them and they were well made, um, but don't they kind of have to use the same house? Don't you think in a way? Don't they have to use the same set? And yeah, what will they have done to Roseanne? Will she have been beamed up to another universe? Yeah. Will well, she be dead? At the very end of the season, she was about to have knee surgery, so they're thinking that she's going to die from the knee surgery. Oh, okay. Do you think it'll That's work? That's fun. <laughs> I mean, do you think it'll work? I think people will still watch. I wonder if, like, conservative America will still watch it. It's true. Um, uh, were you watching the Roseanne reboot, Ryan? Uh, no, I was not. I was at work at the time. I know. You're always working. <laughs> Did you watch it when you were younger, the original? No. No, that wasn't one of my... <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you're answering right here. Stay out. Stay clear. Stay clear of this conversation. Um, I suppose they could always write a plot where Roseanne gets eaten. Oh, God. (laughs) And there goes the one viewer. Um, Well, it returns this fall with everyone. I think everyone's back. 
So, but if, if you figure, if you are the network executives, how can you not try to make this happen, right? It, like it was the highest rated thing since the 1990s or something, and you know they are going to do everything within their power, morally and otherwise, to get this back on. Just to see, you can't step away from what was and could be a gold mine. So, but should everyone? I mean, just talking again about Roseanne profiting for it, should should she not profit? So, I mean, like everyone else. They've, they've there paint, are tons they've of other painted people. a picture that she is not getting compensated for it. So I think pe- people are buying that story. So I think people will uh, Im- be able to watch it guilt free. Well, I'll at least tune into the first episode to see how sure. it goes. Sure. Oh, gosh. I've done, this is so embarrassing. You've got to, you're, we're, we're live. You have to share. I'm it. having a nosebleed. I just had these nosebleeds, like these strange, like you do too much coke before coming here. No, I've never done coke in my life. (laughs) It started in Paris. I just got these random nosebleeds. Oh my god, you're you're having an aneurysm. Oh god, god so oh gosh. (laughs) So so yesterday, I actually went and got it cauterized, which is the most painful thing ever, and And doesn't seem to work. No, exactly. Sorry. Number two. So anyway. What you got for us? Oh, good God, what a strange show. Um, I was in Paris last week. Have I told you that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we were filming with uh, Diane von Furstenberg. Name dropped. And so on the plane, I read her biography. She's a fascinating, absolutely fascinating person. Because yeah. I read her biography from the 70s. Uh, she had one called How to Be Beautiful or something like that. She's absolutely, she's actually had three biographies. Okay. And this one is written by Gioa Diliberto. And uh, it's absolutely amazing because she she really before Princess Diana she had the sort of uh, well she was she princess, yeah the fairy tale princess story when she married uh, Ira was it no Egon von Egan, Furstenberg. Egan von Furstenberg and they were the the toast of Studio Fifty Four they were the the coolest couple in the nineteen seventies she was uh, Edward Egon Peter Paul Giovanni Print Zoo von Furstenberg. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah, totally and cool. um, that's when she designed the wrap dress. That, well, the that... wrap dress was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, in, yeah. In it revolutionized fashion. The gift that keeps on giving. She sold something like one million in three years. And she says, oh, it was nothing really. It was just a few yards of fabric with two sleeves and a wide wrap swash. Sash, not swash, sash. I like swash better. And she said the great thing about the wrap dress was that you could put it on uh, and leave the bedroom without waking a sleeping man. Ah, <laughs> but then, advertise. you know, in the 70s, it was really huge, the wrap dress. And then, like, the market and it, got it went saturated. from day to evening is, is yes. the, the big thing about it. And the fabrics were always fantastic. And it kind yeah. of flatters most women's yeah, bodies. Yeah, everyone looks good in it a wrap does. dress. It was yeah. amazing. I looked fantastic in a wrap dress. Yes, but then <laughs> everybody cooled on the wrap dress. And so her business was left high and dry. And recently, about, like, four years ago, the wrap dress made a comeback but she's an amazing irrepressible life force i mean that's the extraordinary thing about her and and she her mother did a uh, was sort of in the war was in a concentration camp and she survived and she often says this she said that her mother uh i think her mother said uh god save me so that i could give you life and in giving you life i was given my life back so you are my torch of freedom and she said, Diane's always said, Dion, I should say, has always said that that's her sort of life motivation to be this sort of torture freedom for her mother. So uh, it was just an amazing story. And it's a fascinating book. You can purchase Diane von Furstenberg, A Life Unwrapped by Gioa Diliberto on Amazon. Now, sadly, Ryan uh, has to leave us. So we'll oh, say goodbye. Oh, 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 we've loved having you here, Ryan. Ryan has to leave us. He has a meeting. I can't, you know, the hour that you've been with us, you've probably lost, what, like $50 million in sales? This has just been a total waste of time. It's more like $60 million, but you know what? For you guys, it's worth it. Oh. Oh. Ryan, we love you, and we get to watch you every Monday on Bravo, a million dollar listing, and then right afterwards, sell it like Sir Ham. So thank yeah, you for joining two us. Hours, two hours. Two of me. hours. And um, we apologize for everything you had to hear today. <laughs> no problem. I- will swiftly forget. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 And we take a quick break. And when we come back, we will reveal the number one thing that made us go wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. The thing to make you go wow. Week. Wow. Uh, this week. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Gamer Guys. We are your hosts, Evan Michael Lee. This is Chase Colosi. And today we are going to be playing Fortnite. It's a weird, weird story about this game. Oh, good. Fortnite. <laughs> 
It is like the number one game in the world right now. So I'm like, okay, I can't ignore this. Are you any good at this game? Why do I have to help? Are we not in this together? Okay, I don't see anyone. That's the thing. You may not see people for long stretches of time, and that's okay. But look, we're, t we're, t we're number 27. We're doing okay. We haven't done anything. Well, <laughs> that's the thing. You don't have to. That, that is a life lesson right there. You can be like Pearl and just coast. I said I'll let the internet handle that one. And we're back. Rank. <laughs> I, I like the honking. I like you honking. <laughs> I sound a little honky because I got a handkerchief in front of my nose. What color is your handkerchief? No, it's white. white. What does white mean? Surrender. I surrender. <laughs> I give up. I've been stricken by mystery nosebleeds. So if I'm not here next week, you'll know what happened. Number one. Uh, so what's the number one thing that made us go wow this week, guys? I'm looking at the list, and I believe we're going to be talking about Miss Sarah Huckabee's fateful yeah. almost dinner at the Redhead Restaurant over the weekend. The Red Hen. I heard she actually did get to eat some cheeses and meats. There was a cheese. Was there a was little... a cheese board, I believe. Right. You know what kind of place the Red Hen is because they have cheese boards. Am I right? Um, well, it's still unraveling. It's you know. Uh, the, 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 the thing that you just have to say about this yes. is that the Republicans are fine with people turning away big homosexuals. Then they they don't have to make cakes for them. And yet, when we turn away, uh, a, you know, a hate monger, then we're the bad guys. But it's it's perfectly fine for them to discriminate. But when we discriminate, it's a, it's a whole other ball game. So let me just put that in your pipe and smoke it. I, it, it infuriates me to no end. We're on the same side. Yeah. I do think totally. I always am worried about uh, uh, the idea that they do they do uh, constitutionally un 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 unconstitutional things and so so we can too. But no that argument you, but but going to civility I'm with you. But going, every single restaurant and bar has a sign saying we, we refuse to fight service on we reserve it, the right to it, refuse yes. service. Uh-huh. And so there is nothing illegal about what they did with Sarah. There was nothing. There was nothing unconstitutional. Right. And, and Sarah, you know, it, it was not because she was born that way. It's because of something she had done, a behavior. Because she's a hate monger, right. and because she's a liar, and because she's a horrible, horrible woman. There was an article in the New Yorker, yeah. and I'm going to quote it because this kind. I, I, I had trouble articulating it. Unlike James, who's very good about it. But the idea of civility, because there's this notion now that if we're civil. If we're not civil, then we're just as bad as them. But, and then but you... we have learned that when they, I'm sorry, but when they go low, we go high. That doesn't work. There's no right. sense in going high with this administration. And, and this New Yorker article that I read on Michael Hirshhorn's uh, feed oh, is, yeah. and what about civility? Well, fundamental to and governing the practice of civility is the principle of reciprocity. Uh -huh. Your place at my table implies my place at yours. Conservative and liberals, right-wingers and left-wingers, Jews and Muslims, and Christians and socialists, and, and round, and flat earthers, all should have a place at any table and be welcome to sit where they like. <laughs> on the other hand, someone who has decided to make her public role to extend with a blizzard of falsehoods the words of a pathological liar and to support with pretend piety uh, the acts of public uh, of a public person of unparalleled personal cruelty well that person has asked us in advance to exclude her from our common meal you cannot s spit in the plate and then demand your dinner the best way to receive civility at night is not to assault it all day long it's oh. the simple wisdom of the table I like that. The simple wisdom of the table. Yes, it's so appropriate. Civility is, you know, golden rule. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. And she's spending all day, to your point, James, and said without <laughs> as many pauses as mine. But, like, she's kind of, what she does is monstrous. And so who wants to... She sees excluding and, and, I think, and she, her policies and the people that she's supporting are excluding us from the table. Right. Did you see David Lynch came out and said that he thought that Trump might become the, the greatest president of all time and that he was because he was a big Bernie supporter and he likes the fact that Trump is screwing, you know, messing things up and, and shaking up the, the, the status the quo thing, yeah. and everything like that. And that's that thing. It's like Susan Sarandon. These are people who are never going to be affected by Trump's policies. They are rich, white superstars. And right. so for them to say to that they're Bernie supporters, 
supporters or whatever. It, it, it doesn't work for the rest of us. It doesn't, we, it, we cannot just sit back and say, oh, it's good to shake up the status quo or whatever. It's, we have to get out there and fight, and we have to be angry, and we can't just be lackadaisical as, as far as things like Sarah Huckabee I'm, Sanders go. I'm with you on that one. That's why I'm wearing my orange handkerchief, because it means I'm against those jerks. Well, of course, you know, I was so excited. I went on the red hand and said, what was the menu? What were they going to ah! eat? There was spring pea shoot salad, snow peas with spring radishes, cevetio cheese, olive oil, and lemon aioli. A, a lot of gay meals is, is what we see Whipped here. Whipped cow's milk, ricotta, truffle honey, balsamic brown butter, gay, and gay, sea gay. salt. This is a big gay place. I don't even know why she was there. They said that there were a lot of trans workers But then there. I found out I was looking at the wrong red hen. And there's a red hen in D.C. that has been mistaken as the red hen uh, out in Lexington. So they're probably getting a lot of hate. They are. And they yeah. had to post something on their Instagram saying, we are not the red we hand. We love Sarah Huckabee Sanders. She's welcome here at this red hand. They didn't say that. They were very savvy. They said that actually restaurants in the D.C. area are not allowed to discriminate against people on their political beliefs. So that idea that you have the right to not serve anyone, apparently within D.C., you're not allowed to not serve someone. And that's why I'm not going to live in D.C. Well, exactly, exactly. And by the way, so I then thought I'd check out the menu of the real red hand. And their menu's been hacked online. It's just all Chinese gobbledygook. So, but I do believe I've, I have seen uh, online what the menu is, and it is it's, it's a lot of awful, awful food. And yes. it's, um, so, and, and they are right in what they did because there are gay uh, patron or there are gay people who work there who That's would feel supposedly who who, yeah. who said we're yeah. uncomfortable and, and trans people who work there, and so it's not a place that Sarah would even want to be. That, you, that you would think they want, they want that the, homophobe, the best of both that worlds. horrible, horrible harridan. And they weren't charged for what they already ate. So. Oh, okay. That's all we have time for, sadly, on this epic show. Uh, streaming? Are you streaming this summer? We're happy to announce WoW Presents Plus Sickening Summer Series, featuring Ms. Cracker's tutorials. Iconic with uh, Brad Goreski. Yes. Mm -hmm. Drag Tots, our animated series with Detox, Bianca Del Rio, Latrice Royal, Valentina RuPaul herself. Perhaps the best series World of Wonder has ever created at any time, I space or motion. Over um, and over and over again. I can't wait to watch sorry. it. And our steamy lesbian romp scripted British web series, Different for Girls. I love it. So, you know. Three ninety nine a month. That's less than the price of a latte. <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> yeah, and Ryan Sahan, who was here with us earlier, uh, graciously joined us, uh, along with Frederick Acklow and Steve Gold, back for Million Dollar Listings, New York City, it's one season hot cast. seven, Tuesday, ten p.m. Bravo. Oh, my God. By the way, if you're in L.A., you've got to come to see When the Beat Drops, Jamal Sims. Well, I already Jamal Sims directorial debut. Just won a big award at the Frameline Festival. It did, the Grand Jury Prize at Frameline. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be at Outfest here in LA, Thursday, July 15th. Come up. <sighs> There's more, but I'm going to let you all go. It's been lovely. Uh, you know, same time, same place next week, right? We've been plagued with, uh, with technical difficulties, uh, yes. nosebleeds, Nosebleed. uh, inappropriate conversation, mostly <laughs> by me, bad reading. And I'm just hoping we can pull it back together for next week's show. Yeah. I think it's, I thought this was a delight. Maybe our best show no, ever. No, maybe our best show ever. Fine. Or worst yeah. show. Or maybe that's the same thing. It's always a delight and a privilege to be with you guys. Thank indeed. you, Tom. Thank you, James. Thank you, Thank you Blake. See Thank you, you next Ryan. week at 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, go out and do something that makes the world go wow. wow.